We start in 1948, an exciting year bringing in the invention of transistors, an important computer part, as well as Cheetos. But it wasn't all jolly and fun though. Through a series of laws and policies, South Africa segregated its people into white, Indian, colored, and black. They called this apartheid, which literally translates to separateness. The roots of apartheid can be traced back to the political landscape of post-World War II South Africa. In 1948, the National Party, led by Milan, seized power in the general elections. This marked the beginning of a formalized and institutionalized system of racial segregation that would come to be known as apartheid. Apartheid saw the dominance of the white minority over the majority of Africans through a series of discriminatory laws and policies. It sought to segregate people in education, healthcare, and economic opportunities. The establishment of apartheid in 1948 set the stage for decades of systematic oppression, resistance, and ultimately, a struggle for justice and equality. South Africa's legal documents enforced racial segregation. The Population Registration Act of 1950 marked a pivotal moment in the formation of racist policies. South African citizens were categorized into racial groups, white, black, colored, or Indian, based on criteria such as appearance, ancestry, and social acceptance. The classification of individuals would have profound implications on their lives, determining where they could live, work, and access public services. The Population Registration Act also required all citizens to be registered and carry their identity documents indicating their assigned racial group. The act also paved the way for subsequent legislation that would further entrench racial segregation in various aspects of society. The legal framework extended beyond population registration to include a series of discriminatory laws, such as the Group Areas Act, the Separate Amenities Act, and the Bantu Education Act, collectively forming a web of oppressive policies. These laws institutionalized racial inequality, restricted movement, and allocated resources based on racial lines. The race classification system, introduced by apartheid, was a meticulously structured mechanism aimed at categorizing South African citizens based on subjunctive and arbitrary criteria. This racial classification, enforced through the Population Registration Act of 1950, relied on the visual assessment of physical attributes, ancestry, and social acceptance to place individuals into distinctive race of groups. The government appointed officials held significant power in determining an individual's race identity, often leading to absurd and unjust classifications. This classification, beyond being a bureaucratic exercise, became a tool for the systematic enforcement of discriminatory policies, dictating where people could live, work, and interact within society. This unfair treatment and corruption often led to many people disliked by government employees becoming racially targeted. A cornerstone of apartheid's implementation, the Separate Amenities Act of 1953, mandated separate public facilities for different racial groups, similar to the U.S. This law institutionalized the division of essential services, such as education, healthcare, transportation, and recreational spaces, providing vastly unequal resources based on one's racial classification. Under the pretext of separate but equal, non-white South Africans were subjected to worse amenities compared to their white counterparts. This segregation in daily life not only perpetrated racial inequality, but also created a stark visual representation of apartheid's dehumanizing effects, with separate facilities explicitly designed for whites, blacks, colored, and Indian communities. It can be said in many ways South Africa was still colonized by the Europeans. The Bantu Education Act symbolized the intentional stifling of educational opportunities for black South Africans, solidifying the systematic discrimination integral to apartheid's ideology. The consequences of this education system would be felt for generations, underscoring the long-lasting impact of apartheid's policies on the intellectual and the social development of the country's majority population. 
The term Bantu itself was a controversial and derogatory label used to describe black Africans. The curriculum under this act was tailored to prepare black students for a subordinate role in society. The next controversial act, yes, there are a lot more, was the Group Areas Act of 1950, which is still unfortunately seen today. This was a legislative framework that enforced spatial segregation by designating specific areas for residents based on racial classification. This act provided legal justification for the forced removal of nine white communities from areas designated for white settlement. Entire neighborhoods were uprooted and dismantled as people were relocated to designated zones. The Group Areas Act was extreme in reshaping the landscape of South Africa, segregating communities along racial lines and reinforcing the apartheid regime's visions of racially exclusive spaces. This systematic removal of communities laid bare the cruelty of apartheid, disrupting lives and exacerbating the problems of the country. Next are the past laws, which were many regulations that restricted the movement of blacks within their own country, similar to North Korea. Under these laws, individuals were required to carry passbooks, which were documents containing personal details of the holder's racial classification. The past laws aimed to control the movement of non-white South Africans, ensuring they had permission to enter areas designated for whites. Failure to have a valid pass could result in arrest, imprisonment, and deportation. These laws show the dehumanizing nature, treating civilians as outsiders in their own country. The past laws became a symbol of resistance, sparking protests as people fought to change restrictions on their freedom of movement. On March 21st, 1960, the township of Sharpeville became the tragic site of one of apartheid's most infamous incidents, the Sharpeville Massacre. Peaceful protesters gathered against the apartheid past laws, peacefully presenting themselves for arrest at the local police station. However, the South African police responded with a disproportionate and deadly force. They opened fire on the unarmed crowd, killing 69 people and injuring over 180 others. The brutality of the Sharpeville massacre shocked the world, drawing international attention to their oppression. In response to the massacre, the South African government declared a state of emergency, banned public gatherings, and intensified its crackdown on anti-apartheid activists. The events at Sharpeville marked a turning point in the anti-apartheid struggle, creating a global condemnation and spurring renewed efforts to challenge the regime. The international response to Sharpeville was swift and condemning. The UNGA, or the United Nations General Assembly, held an emergency session, and protests erupted worldwide, calling for sanctions against South Africa. The massacre laid bare the violent and repressive nature of the apartheid regime exposing its unwillingness to address complaints through peaceful means. The events at Sharpeville became a catalyst for increased resistance against apartheid, both with South Africa and on the global stage. The aftermath of Sharpeville also witnessed a surge in the anti-apartheid movement's momentum. Internationally, there were growing calls for disinvestment and boycotts against South Africa. As the Sharpeville massacre became a symbol of the inhumane treatment suffered by black South Africans, the tragedy highlighted the urgent need for a reevaluation on the global stance of apartheid and spurred greater solidarity among nations opposed to racial discrimination. In the years that followed, the international community's response to Sharpeville contributed to the mounting pressure on South Africa, pushing for an end to apartheid and the establishment of a free, democratic, and non-racial society. Before we move on, I think it's important to talk about a man named Nelson Mandela. He'll be very important later. So to start off, Nelson Mandela and other anti-apartheid leaders were arrested and charged with sabotage and other crimes. Mandela's powerful speech during the trial became a rallying cry for the anti-apartheid movement. Mandela then unfortunately spent 27 years in prison on Robben Island, enduring the harsh conditions and little communication with the outside world. Pressure for his release intensified over the years until he was released in 1990, where he then gave his speech to change South Africa forever, but more on him later because he's very important to leading to the end of apartheid. Now let's move on to another very prominent figure who's actually a child. His name is Hector Peterson. In 1976, a peaceful demonstration about Afrikaans in schools quickly escalated into a violent confrontation with the police. In a tragic turn of events, the police opened fire on the unarmed students, resulting in numerous deaths and injuries. One of the most iconic images from the uprising is that of Hector Peterson, a 13-year-old boy being carried by a fellow student after being fatally shot. 
The photograph captured the world's attention and became a symbol of the brutality faced by Africans under apartheid. This photo sparked a wave of protests and resistance across the country, with students leading the charge against the oppressive education system. The government's response to the uprising was ruthless, leading to further loss of life, arrests, and a crackdown on anti-apartheid activism. This day is still remembered during Youth Day, a national holiday in South Africa. Apartheid South Africa faced increasing isolations, as nations, organizations, and individuals globally protested against the regime. The United Nations as well imposed sanctions on South Africa to end apartheid. Now here comes the end of apartheid, finally. And it's all thanks to democracy. De Klerk's reforms, initiated in the late 1980s, marked a significant departure from the staunch apartheid policies that had characterized South Africa for decades. Frederick Willem de Klerk, who assumed the presidency in 1989, realized the need for change in response to both internal pressures and the shifting global political landscape. His reforms were instrumental in dismantling key pillars of apartheid and laying the groundwork for the transition to a democratic, non-racial South Africa. One of the largest moments in de Klerk's presidency was his speech to the parliament on February 2nd, 1990, where he announced a series of decisions. This included unbanning the anti-apartheid organizations such as the African National Congress, or ANC, and the Pan-African Congress, or PAC, which had been banned for decades. Additionally, political leaders, including Nelson Mandela, who had been in prison for 27 years at this point, were finally released. De Klerk's reforms also involved the initiation of negotiations for a new political dispensation in South Africa. These negotiations took place through a process known as the Convention for a Democratic South Africa, or CODESA. The talks included representatives from the various political parties, including the ANC and the National Party. The negotiations aimed to establish a democratic system that would end racial discrimination and lead to the creation of a government representative of the entire population. Nelson Mandela and President de Klerk spearheaded discussions aimed at dismantling apartheid's legislative framework. These negotiations navigated complex issues such as power sharing and the formation of a non-racial government. Simultaneously, the Truth and Reconciliation Commission, or the TRC, led by Desmond Tutu, played a huge role in addressing the nation's traumatic past. The TRC served as a structured platform for victims and perpetrators to testify, seek amnesty, and contribute to a comprehensive truth-telling process. While the TRC faced criticism for its perceived shortcomings, it significantly contributed to acknowledging historical injustices and fostering an environment conducive to the nation's healing. 1994, a landmark year for South Africa's democratic journey. The elections marked a transformative movement, with citizens exercising their democratic rights across racial lines. The negotiations and TRC, though not perfect, laid the groundwork for a unified, democratic South Africa. Soon they began repealing laws. One of the landmark decisions was the repeal of the Land Acts. By dismantling these restrictions, the government sought to address historical land disposition and pave the way for a more equal distribution of land, challenging one of the core elements of apartheid. The Group Areas Act was another key target for this repeal. The end of this act signified the dismantling of enforced residential segregation, allowing for greater mobility and integration across racial lines. It was a significant stride towards fostering a society where individuals could choose their residences based on personal preference rather than arbitrary racial classifications. Simultaneously, the Population Registration Act and the Separate Amenities Act were abolished. These repeals underscored a commitment to ending the institutionalized discrimination that had permeated every part of South African society. By dismantling apartheid's legal foundations, the government signals its commitment to creating a society founded on principles of equality, justice, and inclusivity. The legislative reforms, coupled with ongoing negotiation and reconciliation efforts, collectively forged a path towards a new era in South Africa's history, one defined by democratic values and the rejection of racial prejudice. Despite the progress made in the reconciliation progress, challenges persisted. Economic disparities, educational inequalities, and the legacies of apartheid social engineering posed ongoing hurdles. Reconciliation required not only acknowledging historical injustices, but also addressing issues that increased inequality. The post-apartheid era in South Africa, while marked by triumph over institutionalized racial segregation, has been fraught with a massive amount of challenges, reflecting the complex legacy left by decades of apartheid. One of the foremost issues confronting the nation was the formidable task of socio-economic transformation. 
Apartheid had entrenched profound disparities in wealth, education, and opportunities, and dismantling these structures required large efforts. The ANC grappled with creating a more equitable society, addressing high levels of unemployment, and uplifting historically marginalized communities. Corruption also emerged as a big problem in the post-apartheid period, impacting various areas of public life. The ANC, in particular, faced accusations of corruption within its ranks, raising concerns about the misuse of public resources and hindering effective governance. Education also remained a key battleground in the post-apartheid area. Despite efforts to address historical inequalities, the education system faced challenges such as inadequate resources, disparities in quality, and persistent education gaps. In the realm of foreign policy, South Africa sought to redefine its role on the global stage. The nation transitioned from the international isolation during the apartheid era to actively engaging in diplomatic initiatives and peacekeeping efforts in Africa, creating a large diplomatic challenge. Unfortunately, many of these problems still remain at large today, and it will continue to take South Africa many decades to recover. Thank you for watching.